In this episode of Pop Culture Weekly, it's all about the brand new series, Billy the Kid on Epix. Let's go! Welcome to Pop Culture Weekly with Kyle McMahon from iHeartRadio. Your pop culture news, views, reviews, and celebrity interviews on all the movies, TV, music, and pop culture you crave weekly. Here's Kyle McMahon. Na, na, na. Hello and welcome to Pop Culture Weekly with Kyle McMahon. I, of course, am Kyle McMahon and I thank you so much for hanging out with me and, you know, listening to the show and talking about pop culture, all the movies and TV and streaming and technology and stuff that we love. So today... It's all about the brand new series on Epics called Billy the Kid. If you have not seen this yet, you can watch the trailer. The The link is in the show notes. It is so good. It airs exclusively on Epics, and the cast is phenomenal, and it really is... Um, a it's you know it's a western there's some brutal parts it's really great but at the heart it really is the story of the man billy the kid who is born william h bonnie so it tom it stars tom blythe as billy daniel weber is his i guess kind of mentor in billy the kid who and it was his real mentor in real life as well he plays Jesse Evans, and Jesse was kind of the bad boy that influenced Billy to become, you know, this this legendary, you know, Western anti-hero, Billy the Kid. He's amazing in, in the series. Eileen O'Higgins plays Kathleen, who's Billy's mother, and the story, you know, the series goes back and forth kind of between Billy as a child with Billy as a man. And he was heavily influenced by his mother and, you know, what a lot of us boys are. Uh, and, you know, kind of the, the tragic circumstances that that come to his family when they come from Ireland to America. So so I talk with them all about that. I also talk with the producers michael hurst who he, he created the show he also created vikings so you know what kind of series this is and uh and donald deline so donald was you know he's a big producer he used to be the head of production at paramount pictures and uh they have a lot of cool insights into the making of billy the kid why it's important for this story to be out now, why they decided to make this show. So lots and lots and lots of good stuff. Also, later, I interview the director and creator of The Last Mountain, which is this incredible documentary. His name is Chris Terrell. He is such uh, a unique guy, and he's had a absolutely incredible career as a one-man filmmaker. He really is an anthropologist at heart. I shouldn't say at heart. I, I believe he's trained as an anthropologist and then began making these like kind of one man documentaries uh, with some pretty famous ones um, where he's gotten inside access to things that, you know, most people don't get access to. So his latest film, The Last Mountain, is a feature documentary about Tom and Kate Ballard who are mountaineers and siblings that uh, there are some tra tragic circumstances around that entire family. And we talk about the film, The Last Mountain. So without further ado, let's start with Michael Hurst and Donald DeLine with the Billy the Kid series on epics. Here they are, Michael Hurst and Donald DeLine. Hi, Michael and Donald. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. That's a pleasure. Nice to meet Good morning. you. Morning. Nice to meet you both as well. So I am loving Billy the Kid, and it it strikes me as uh, as unique in many ways. Um, but first, I'd like to ask you both: Why was this story important to both of you to make? 
Um, well, the, 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 the principal reason is because I've um, loved Billy since I was a kid. And I grew up in the north of England, which is about as far from New Mexico as you can get. <laughs> So in many ways, I'm not sure why, but when I was seven or eight years old running to school, um, you know, through the landscape, I, I, I wasn't running to school. I was riding a gray horse and being pursued by a posse, you know, and I was Billy the Kid. And, um, and I guess doing this uh, show gave me the opportunity to examine whether Billy was worth idolizing you know and uh, and he, he definitely is but so it does so for me in in a curious way it's very personal a uh, piece of work i love that and how about for you don uh really the same i always had a fascination with billy the kid uh, i didn't grow up in the north of england but my <laughs> grandfather uh was a cowboy from wyoming he grew up on a ranch on a back of a horse and in my childhood i uh, heard stories about it Every uh, time I spent time with him and every summer we'd go visit all the relatives on the ranch back in Wyoming and they had a little town with wooden sidewalks. It was really something. And so I always had a real fascination for the West and, and a real kind of romantic vision of that life. I, you know, it's interesting because as, as both of you are talking, I'm thinking it's kind of, you know, for a lot of children, uh, it's a dream potentially to work on a project like this and bring it to life, you know, as so many of us grew up playing, you know, a cowboy or, or yeah. whatever, and that kind of uh, um, uh, idealized, not, not that this is particularly idealized, but in that kind of, you know, um, yeah. dream sort of thing. Uh, this, you know, with him being a, in some ways, very controversial figure, how do you, how do you find the line between making him um, a likable, lovable guy that you want to befriend <laughs> compared to, you know, potentially a monster in some people's eyes? Um, well, I went into the research with a very open mind. Um I wanted to to see if I could discover his background, his beginnings, who he was, what made him. Uh, of course, in order to understand the man, you've got to understand the child. So, you know, understanding his immigrant uh, background, understanding the the time that he lived, um, beginning to understand what might have motivated him, what why he became an outlaw and beginning in that process to understand that most of the things that I thought were true about Billy weren't true, that most of the cliches aren't true. You know, I mean, it's very easy to imagine that um, someone like Billy the Kid would be a psychopathic killer, you know, that he would enjoy killing. Um, and that would give him a, 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 a sort of very masculine reputation. Uh, in in the those times, in the violent times of the West, but nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I discovered that Billy was a extremely sensitive young boy, young man, very influenced by his Catholic mother, who gave him a sort of moral grounding that um, that he never lost. Um, he himself said that he was more sinned against than sinning. Uh, he was blamed for lots of things that he didn't do. And after a while, obviously, he was pursued uh, by posses and by headhunters, bounty hunters for money. So he was kind of defending himself um, in a way. But the principal thing is that I discovered that he was a, a deeply thoughtful, sensitive, attractive uh, character who identified very much as, as coming from an immigrant immigrant family he identified with other dispossessed people including and particularly the Mexicans at the at the time he learned to speak Spanish um, was a great defender of the the, the, the Mexicans uh, so I just you know I, I sort of demythologized Billy in my own mind in order to to see the real Billy or to try and see the real Billy and make the show as authentic uh, as it as it can be as it could be which I think it is I think it's the most authentic telling of, of, of the story the most human telling of the story 
But I mean, who knew, frankly, that Billy had the most beautiful singing voice, mm -hmm. that he was the life and soul of any party, <clears throat> that people who knew him well loved him. Um, all these things I had no idea about. And, and all of these things give the texture and color to the, to the show, I think. So, so I, again, I ended up by mythologizing him again, you know, but in a different way. He's a different uh, uh, creature to the one I think we've seen represented on screen for, for so long. Absolutely. It very much humanizes him, you know, and, and it's, yeah. he's almost, he's a hero, um, but he's also an anti-hero. It's a very, yeah. Uh, yeah. very yeah. interesting dictatum. I shouldn't use words that I can't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> very interesting dictatum, whatever it is. Dichotomy. Dichotomy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and how, how about for you, Donald? Do you, do you, was that yeah. kind of similar for you? Yes, I think Michael, uh, of course, expressed it very well. Um, I think that Billy was a very complicated character. He he was full of contradictions as well. So there's the light and the dark side, as there is in everyone. I think that, you know, he grew up in extremely rough circumstances, um, kind of abject poverty. You know, his father uh, died when he was very young. His brother died. His mother had trouble. It was very hard for a woman to uh, fend for herself and provide for her family. And he really, it was a slippery slope. You know, he kind of got in by doing some petty crime to really help them survive uh, to begin with. And one thing after another transpired, as Michael said, then he, you know, had was branded as kind of a, a you know, a little thief and a, and a scalawag. And then he got accused of other things, sometimes un unjustly. And it, it, it really was something um, that just kind of took on a life of its own. And it always haunted him. He really wanted to be, um, you know, on the straight and narrow. And it was just. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very important. Yeah. I think that Billy always wanted to go straight. And eventually he was offered the opportunity by this English uh, guy called John Tunstall, uh, who believed in him, who saw something good in, 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 in him. And, uh, and th that was the chance Billy had waited for all his life to be respected, to be able to go straight, to do a decent job. And then, of course, Tunstall was murdered. And that put an end to, to that opportunity. And even after the Lincoln County water, uh, War, when the new governor offered amnesties for everyone who'd been involved in the war and specifically wanted to see Billy and offer him an amnesty and was staggered when Billy walked into the room and said, my God, you're so young, you know, uh, to have this reputation. But I want you to accept an amnesty. And Billy said, basically, it's too late. There are too many people out there who want to kill me. So if I accept your amnesty, you know, I'll be dead in a couple. Of he said, I would like nothing more. I've always wanted to, to go straight, you know, and be legal. But I, it's the chance has gone. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so in a way, his, his, his life is a tragedy. On the other hand, if you think about it, here is a guy who reputedly was shot dead at, at the age of 21, 22, who lived in the middle of the 19th century, in the middle of nowhere, who is still one of the most famous people in Western history. I mean, get that. I mean, that mm -hmm. is extraordinary to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a, a lot accomplished in a young time. Yeah, I, I I appreciate both of you. Thank you so much. I can't wait for the world to see Billy the Kid only on Epics. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's really, really, really super interesting for me, at least, and I'm sure for you, since you're pop culture lovers yourselves, to hear the stories behind you know, why a show like Billy the Kid gets made or Vikings or whatever. You know, there really is a love of this history and these stories deserve to be told. So great, great, great guys. Love that conversation. Now let's talk with the stars of Billy the Kid, Tom Blythe, Eileen Higgins and Daniel Weber. First of all, thank you, Tom, Daniel, and Eileen, for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having us, Carl. Cheers. Of yeah. course. I absolutely love Billy the Kid. The series is incredible. It's a ride that I wasn't expecting. I didn't know what to expect going in, and I'm so glad that 
I got on that ride. For the three of you, you know, how is it to portray characters that were very real people? You know, is that different as actors for you? And uh, just randomly, Daniel, since you're at the top of my box, did you want to start? Yeah, uh, it is different. Uh, for me, however, I've played quite a few real people and they're more recent history. Uh, some are still alive. And so you have a huge responsibility uh, in that case to be as authentic and, and, and real and just do your utmost to try and tell their story as, as exactingly as you can. With this, Jesse is a real person, but I kind of felt so much freedom uh, to to explore him. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a lot of history that you can dig into with him, but there's also a lot of gaps uh, and you can sort of play around and fill those gaps and I don't know. There's lots to still color in with him, which I was really excited to. I was just very excited to be able to have that slight distance uh, from. Nobody can be like, ah, he didn't do a good job. He didn't look anything <laughs> like Jesse. He didn't sound anything like Jesse. He didn't say that that way. What's that American accent? <laughs> yeah. So um, that was really cool. And how about for you, Tom? Yeah, there's a there's a kind of freedom that comes with it being slightly less recent history. I think also. You know, not there's no video footage of these guys. There's no radio interviews, <laughs> for example. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, you kind of you you read the books and you try and honor the person as much as you can. But then there's a certain point where you realize that it has to be your your version of them, no matter what. It's you know, there's a certain point where the books. I don't know if you guys find this, Eileen and Daniel, but you you kind of you delve into the books, you delve into the history, and suddenly you start to go, "Ooh, I, I have to honor my own." imagination here as well like I have to I have to bring him to life as he speaks to me um like I, I took a trip to New Mexico and, and did a road trip right before we started filming and kind of visited all the spots that Billy lived in and, and died in and visit his visited his graveside um and that for me was the most palpable thing like I, all the books were very useful but they're all they're all opinions really these historic accounts and so going to his graveside and kind of Sounds a little out there, but like almost asking permission from him to mm -hmm. be like, hey, I'm going to play you. Hope that's OK. Cheers, dude. Um, and <laughs> walking away, uh, you know, there was uh, kind of a, a weird spiritual aspect to it, which I really appreciated. Like those, you know, and so many people have played him that you, you're never going to do the same thing twice. There's, there's you know, I don't know. They're, they're, and these people were, were fighters. They were survivors. They're endlessly interesting to play. And so there's, there's so much richness that you can delve into and find your own your own version there. And how about for you, Eileen? I especially loved in re in regards to you know being his mother is was is an was an extremely important part of his life. So knowing that with that lens, did you find that as well as what the boys are saying? I think I think absolutely. I think there was probably even less for me, right? <laughs> Women in history, um, but uh, we. I think for me, the the even right from reading Michael's script, the importance that this woman had on Billy's life made this part sort of like, I don't know, I felt a little reverential mm -hmm. towards it and then had to take it down off the pedestal to actually walk in the shoes. And um, so I think there's an element of understanding how important it is to play uh, to play this part and who it is, but then to just bring it right back to like, empathy and understanding the ways in and understanding the motivations of of who she is um so yes the i think the the time that's passed give a little bit of uh freedom there to put your interpretation on things but i think uh the impact she had on who he was and that that kind of story i hadn't seen before mm -hmm. and i wanted to make sure that i try my best to do a good job with that bit of I, it <laughs> and i think i think you did an amazing job and i'll i'll start with you going backwards now um the you know it's interesting because billy the kid the series humanizes many of these people who you know throughout history at one time or another could be seen as monsters 
Um, how, you know, in, in some ways, how for you, Eileen, uh, how do you as an actor and obviously, you know, you, you were again, this kind of reverential, like, ah, you know, character with like the chorus of angels in many ways, but how, you know, as, as an actor, do you kind of, um, bring that humanity to a character in particular for you, somebody that didn't have as much history as, you know, Billy or Jesse? Um, this, this, the script was just like the most amazing tool for, for getting into the character and the story, you know, the, the fact that Michael chose to tell Billy's story right from when he was a small boy so that you understand who the man is, is, is really everything. So for me, sort of like coming at it, I think, I think I approached it very similarly to what how I would approach any part that I mm. previously done, even though it is a real part, which is just, um, it's gonna, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it's all just about finding the truth. Right. So like the truth of the truth of who this person is, the truth of who, what, what, how they would respond in certain ways and how they would feel towards certain people. Um, but the scripts and the story and the idea that it was started right from the inception of who Billy was as a young boy um, was super important and super helpful for me going forward to like start to play the part. If anything, it's sort of, it's a drama, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a family drama. That's how I was coming at this, was playing the story. You know, like we even touch on the fact that, you know, Patty passes away from a mental illness. I've never seen that depicted in a Western mm-hmm. before. So all of these people suddenly become very relatable to me, very relatable to you. And suddenly you can really feel what it would have been like to head West before the West is the West. Right. And and for Tom, for you, you know, going with that and how, how do you balance that being like this anti-hero, but, all, you know, but also hero in many ways? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I love so much about this series is that Michael Hurst, our creator and showrunner, he he really does. I mean, humanize, like Eileen said, is, is the best word to describe it. He humanizes these people who we think of as, as monsters or as as uh, killers and he asks the question, why? Like, why are they like that? You know, and I think that's why we're drawn to these kind of shows that do show violence and they do show trauma and difficult uh, human experiences because we we want to understand them. You know, I think deep down we want to understand what it means to be human. And mm-hmm. one of those kind of the key to that is understanding what it means to survive trauma. Um, and I think this show does that really well. And I think as an actor, uh, all you can really do is say, well, why, what made him this way? You know, like, and the beauty of this show is that it starts very early on. We see Billy growing up, which is, we've never seen that before. All the movies, they've never delved into his childhood. Um, And so we get to see through the first eight episodes. And then when we go into future seasons more, um, we get to see this boy become a man and this man become a killer. And we get to see why we get to ask you know, he he wasn't born a killer. You know, like there there are things that happen along the way that make him that way. Um, and if you were if you were alive today and you were able to ask him, he'd probably have a really valid defense that he thought was valid for why he did what he did. Um, and I think that's what's most interesting about it. And for you, Daniel? Um, yeah, I mean, it's you approaching this guy before I even got scripts. I was looking at the history of it all, and you know, he's he was at the time one of the most infamous figures in the, the New Mexico region. Um, and so you have that, that side of him uh, and you're aware of this, this, you know, kind of awful past, this past, which is theft and racism. And he's a, he's a killer and, and whatnot. But the thing that humanized him uh, ultimately for me and was everything for me was the stories that I came across very early on about him and Billy um, and their relationship. And it started with them. I think the very first book I read was Pat, Pat, Pat Garrett's book. And it's all about, it's almost like a tally ho adventure of, of Jesse and Billy at some points. Like they're just having the best fun adventures, which, you know, is, is so, it's so colored and over the top, but there's a lot of stories that are in that vein, these guys as young, young uh, figures, have, you know, traveling the West. And then of course, during the war, 
they they ended up on separate sides and they had a bit of en- enmity and and it was it was quite you know toxic for a long time and then the one thing that really kind of landed for me uh was when jesse eventually uh got put in prison for murder and he was in texas and he had no help around uh the only person he wrote to he didn't write to his his, his gang or his man he actually wrote to billy the kid to come and break him out um and and then billy never responded and then they never saw each other again after that like around that time but it was he, jesse reached out to this guy who who he'd sort of proclaimed for a long time was his bitter enemy and i just thought it was such a beautiful look at like what the depth of this relationship and 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 what 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 billy actually really meant to him outside of all the bluster and outside of all of the competitive rubbish um there was this real trust and love uh for the guy I, I love it. I love the series. I love you guys, all three of you in it. And I can't wait for everybody to see Billy the Kid exclusively on Epics. Thank you, guys. Thank you so Thanks, much. Uh, Have a great day. You too, Carl. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, right? I'm telling you, I have seen Billy the Kid. It is really good. You're going to love it. It is out right now on Epics. And uh, and just enjoy it and let me know what you think. You are going to love it. All right. So next up is Chris Terrell, the documentary filmmaker, anthropologist, you know, British filmmaking legend, uh, you know, one man crew. And he just embeds himself in these stories. And this story, his latest film, The Last Mountain, is tragic beautiful, heartbreaking, uh, you know, nail biting. And uh, it's, you've got to see this film. So here he is. How are you, Chris? I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. It's a great, great pleasure. So first of all, there's, I want to talk about your new film, The Last Mountain, but you have had a incredibly uh, extraordinary career. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. You have done, first of all, you're an Emmy winner. You have done numerous uh, films that uh, really touch on people. You know, at the heart, it's it's the, the people behind it. Why has that been important for you? I'm an anthropologist by training. Is my, my first degree was in anthropology. Um, then I started to do a doctorate in it. And, and uh, for, for most of my early professional career, I was a field anthropologist working in mostly in Africa. And as an anthropologist, I'm primarily concerned with how people tick and how communities tick. Um, and then my, my I guess my, my research interest in, in terms of people were, were people living in, in hazardous situations. I was fascinated by the way people do respond to danger, to hazard, to peril, to risk, whether it be in war situations or in, in, in environmental, uh, environmentally extreme situations. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time in, 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 in your country in looking at people living in Tornado Alley, in, in, in the path of hurricanes in California with the wildfires um, uh, are. And so, you know, it's fascinating. I think people are... Some, are usually at their very best when confronted by hazard, best in terms of their own, um, them, themselves as individuals, but also the way they work together. And I think it's about group uh, groups and how people work together and um, and help each other when you, you, you do find people at their best. Um, I just come back, for example, from Ukraine, uh, where you know, the, world, the eyes of the world are on Ukraine right now. And we are seeing terrible things. We are seeing actually humanity in some ways at its worst, but importantly, at its best as well. Mm-hmm. And that's what fascinates me. I, I, it's all about you. I love that. And, you know, one of your, I guess you could say your a signature of yours is that you're kind of a lone wolf sort of filmmaker in a lot of ways. Was that through necessity or preference? Oh, prefer- oh, preference, absolutely, yes. It, 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 it has its own, it has its, has its advantages, I mean, in terms of budget and, uh, and, and, and just, I don't have to worry about a crew and their times and the expense of having uh, you know, several people on a team 
I'm just I'm just my own man. I can go where I want when I want. But the important thing is, as I said, as an anthropologist, I always used to work alone. I would embed in a community and to become my job is really as both anthropologist and filmmaker is to see the to see the world through the eyes of others uh, as best I can. And that means suspending my own worldview, suspending my own judgments, my own, my own value judgments and trying to and, and not be judgmental. And, and, and that's quite tricky, but it does mean embedding deeply into a community. Um, yes, yeah, so, so it, yeah, it's about um, kind of uh, t- tuning in to, to another way of life. And um, you can only do that by yourself. If you go into a situation with a team of people, and it, 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 I'm not saying it doesn't work, there's some fantastic filmmakers, of course, who work with crews, but it can create a them and us situation. With me, um, I get absorbed into a community. I just, last year, I spent an entire year on board a, a British warship um, going out to the South China Seas, and I lived as a sailor. I wore a uniform. Wow. I wasn't, try- I wasn't trying to be something I wasn't. Everybody knew who I was. I was Chris, the guy with the camera. But I tried to live my life as they did. So and that, that broke down boundaries and broke down barriers so that I could, I could key into their, their way of seeing. It, it, that's, that's the key expression, I think. It's a way of seeing. It's it's amazing to hear you talk about this. And I, you know, on a much smaller scale, um, you know, I'll go to a press junket or to interview, you know, um, somebody about their film or whatever. And I am oftentimes doing it by myself. It's a joy when I have a uh, producer with me and cameraman and all that. But, uh, you know, oftentimes I, I'm doing it myself. Uh, yeah. How do you, you know, what I find fascinating is what you said about being non-judgmental. If you're doing something, you know, there's so many things that uh, and now I'm realizing how judgy I am. Uh, but if there's something I'm passionate about, you know, environmental causes or whatever, and I see something that I feel is a disservice or harming or whatever, how do you keep that judgment out of not only your work, but of, of saying something or, or intervening? Um, it's, it's, it's often very difficult, you know, because I've, I've done a lot of work um, in prisons, for example, um, where, you know, pe- people, uh, you know, there are some bad guys in prisons, but there are also many people who are there because they're for the grace of God go I. They, life hasn't been fair to them. They've made mistakes. And actually, they're perfectly good people. They've just it's just gone wrong for them. Um, but, you know, there, there are different ethical attitudes, the different moral attitudes, and one has to accommodate them. And you have to sometimes be very strict with yourself. Don't judge this guy. Don't judge whoever it is. Uh, and because usually there's a reason for people, mm. the way people behave. Um, but no, sometimes it, it, it is difficult and, indeed. Um, and you know when I've dealt, when I've lived with um, tribes in Africa or the, the nomad nomads in the far, in the Middle East, um, you do have to adopt different attitudes to uh, all, all sorts of things, um, and you, you 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 can only suspend your own your own. You know, I've, I was brought up in in Britain. I've got very British attitudes when I'm being Chris Terrell, but very often. I'm not being Chris Terrell, I'm being something else, somebody else. And when I come home, um, my wife um, usually has to give me a little bit of leeway, a little bit of time before I return to my own, to my, being myself. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting process, but sometimes quite complicated uh, psychologically. And- but I think as, as an anthropologist, I'm, I'm kind of trained to do this. It's something that you learn to do. It's called, we have a term for it. It's called participant observation. I observe by participating. I don't observe by standing off and, and look, looking on. I get involved. I get down there and I get, I get um, in amongst it. Um, and it's, um, I mean, I've been doing it all my career and I never tire of it. It's endlessly fascinating. I've got to say, people are amazing. I, well, and I've got to say, you know, it's got to be literally eye opening. I mean, you see, uh, you know, especially by the participant observation, you are 
as you said, embedding yourself in a culture or a group or town or belief or whatever. Um, And, you know, suspending those judgments has got to be mind opening. You know what I mean? Uh, It it is. And and it can be. um, I mean, it's very um, exhilarating uh, and you, you learn a lot about the human condition. But you also have to deal with the the darkness sometimes of the human condition. Um, I've done, I did six tours, uh, military tours of Afghanistan, for example, um, and that meant I had to go, go deep into frontline combat and, and to see the consequences of that, which are, you know, there's nothing worse than war. Again, referring to Ukraine at the moment, which you know everybody's watching, but. In, you know, seeing young men going into combat and some not coming back or some coming back minus legs and arms uh, and seeing the life destroyed in, in, in that process. It's, um, it's fascinating because it's taking me deep into something, deep into a human experience, but it's a very dark experience. And in a lot of these young men suffer emotionally, mentally afterwards, you know, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is a, a, a desperate situation to be in. But, and I'll be very honest with you, after many years of doing this, both working in famine zones in Africa, seeing dead babies in mother's arms, seeing young men mutilated and killed, um, I was myself diagnosed with PTSD a couple of years ago. Uh, so you're, you're, you're not um, invulnerable. To, mm-hmm. to, to these things. But I'm, I'm very honest about that. I'm open to it. It's part of the process. It's part, it's part of the experience. Wow. Your, your latest film, The Last Mountain, is, you know, uh, builds on all of these things that we're, we're talking about. And it is really a beautiful film. You know, I particularly took to this because I lost my mom um, to pancreatic cancer almost one year ago today. And uh, this, this, thank you. This film is, you know, it's heavy and, but it's beautiful. And, you know, to me, it's really ultimately a testament to love. It really, really is. And, you know, you have Allison, uh, you have Tom who's, who's kind of following in his mother's footprints, uh, intentionally and then quite unintentionally and then you know kate the the, his sister and why it and it really is very much a uh, i I read something as i was um reading up on it that said it really is two documentaries and two last mountains and uh i that really hit home with me you know having seen the movie because it it really is a multiple part story spanned over decades but it's the same story taking everything else out it's the same story of love for me do you do you feel that you know is that how you feel about it what what is your take on this oh yeah it it is it's imbued with with love um you know people talk about it as a mountain film i've never seen it as a mountain Mm -hmm. film. it's a film about family it's a film about um, sibling love it's a film about uh, grief it's a film about bereavement um and to the extent it's about mountains it's actually for me about the inner mountain the mountains within us that we all have to climb you know you you've had to do do that yourself with the loss the loss of your mum your mother um you that's a, a mountain of grief that you had to You've had to summit. I lost my own parents um, a couple of years ago. I'm sorry. That's that. It, my parents were both 98, and it was they had a, a good life. But I miss them, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I've I've had to climb my own inner peak of grief, and that's what Tom and Kate had to do as children when they lost their mother, Alison, and indeed Jim, their father, and then God forbid, 25 years later. Um, Jim and Kate had to, have had to do the same with the loss of Tom. Um, but what shines through the torment and the misery and the sadness um, is is love. It's what sustains us. You know, it's it's a it's a cliche. I'm not, I don't want to get all hippie about this, but the fact is, all that I've seen in my in my life uh, and the and the, the 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 
torment and the hurt and the pain um, from all that I've immersed myself in, um, love has, has shone through and has sustained people. And I, I think this is so key to this story, The Last Mountain. And I wouldn't want people to think, oh my God, it's a film about tragedy and death. Uh, well, it is. But actually, I wouldn't want people to think it's a it, it's it's a tear fest. It, 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 to some extent, it is. Mm. But I like to think there's an uplifting conclusion to it. That it goes somewhere. That you come out of it thinking, "Wow, that was some story." But I feel better for seeing it rather than worse. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. When I was sent over the film, it really hit me at a particular time, and for me, I, I just felt like it was meant to be. And so, you know, when my mom passed, uh, I emailed the CEO of iHeart and I said, I have an idea for a limited series um, show, 13 episode podcast called Death, Grief and Other Shit We Don't Discuss. And I want to go out and, you know, episode by episode, each topic, each episode is a different topic relating to death. So a diagnosis, the actual physical death, uh, death rituals, you know, each going yeah. all the way to trying to move on. And yeah. um, so I'm, I'm filming and you know, in production for that now. And that has been hard for me. You know, I did it in that grief of uh, my mom just passed. I need to do something. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, I very much felt like a, a uh, kinship with both Tom and his sister, Kate, because yeah. it's like, what can I do to control these emotions that I'm feeling in honor of them, you know? And, yeah. and so I felt that, kinship with them uh and you know some people might say well why would you do that you lost your mom to that well that's exactly why i would want to try to do that you know that's why yeah that's why and and it's what kate is a remarkable young woman um and and you know but she's she's had to um undergo and still was undergoing the process of grief she still hurts of course she does um, she was so close to Tom, and I think sometimes she she finds it very difficult to to deal with the fact that he's no longer there. But um, she is very honest; she's very open, and I, I like to think we captured some of that on film. And certainly, a lot of people have responded from after seeing the film. They've responded by writing to Kate to thank her for helping them deal not with the loss of a mountaineering brother, but with the loss of a mum mm -hmm. or of a of a loved one. And I think it does, uh, I think the film does take us some way into that whole process of how do we deal with the inevitable, every, every single one of us will at some point deal with the loss of a loved one. It's life, it's what happens. And some of us are ready for it, and usually we're not ready for it, but we need to, we need to understand the process, which I, I think with your idea, what you're doing is fantastic. And, and I think it'll be helpful to so many people. Thank you. And that was my goal. You know, I, I said, I want this to be the show that I can't find for me right now. Um, mm. And so, you know, just doing these, one of the episodes is called, we're all going to die. And it's dealing with my realization that, wait a second, you know, my mom w was taken 30, 40 years too young. And, yeah. uh, but wait, that can happen to me too. Wait, everybody I love is going to die at some point. And, yeah. and it, you know, me working through that with, you know, some amazing professionals, but I, my goal is to, for it to ultimately help other people. Mike Posner is one of my favorite, uh, artists ever. And, um, when his father passed away, he, in that moment, much like Tom and Kate and myself needed to do something. And so he walked on foot from New Jersey to California and literally walked across America and he did it kind of for his father but along the way he realized he has the power to help so many people going through yeah. their own stuff and i just think you know it's a testament to what you were saying a bit earlier that at, at, the human condition ultimately is to love and and part of that means serving uh our neighbors or loved ones or community or whatever um and and you know, there is an inherent uh, selfishness to that, but it's also a selflessness because you are brave enough to do it. I mean, it's terrifying. I could never climb a mountain, a literal mountain like that. But, 
you know, he and and you know they they were brave enough to to do this uh, to have that connection with their loved one. Absolutely, and I think the other the other thing that I've come to to recognize is that gr- grief is very painful and it's erosive of the soul and the heart, and we we you know it's very difficult to know how to deal with it. But we need grief. I don't want to stop grieving for my mother and father because I don't want to forget them. So actually grief, you can start to control it rather than have it control you. And it becomes part of you. You will never forget your mum. You'll never forget your mother. So to that extent, you will always grieve for her. But that's in a good, that's a good way. And I find that I find that attitude towards death. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about religion now, I'm not talking about belief systems. That's something else. But I have seen this in all sorts of cultures. From from tropical Africa to Middle East to the the Sami nomads of, of of the Arctic, this attitude to uh, grief actually giving you something it's a gift. Wow! So we we've we got to learn to 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 um, value that gift. Wow, that's that's uh, a big aha moment, you know, because you don't think of it as a gift. But but as you're saying, you know, I hope to get to a point where that grief is no longer so painful and is more happy memories and that feeling of being connected. Because you wouldn't have grief if it because it's based on love. It's based on something beautiful and precious. And uh, we don't grieve for people we don't like it's, mm. or, 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 that, or that are strangers. It's irrelevant. But somebody who's close to us has touched our hearts. That's what makes grief glow. So, But we need to recognize that glow rather than see it as a dark thing. Wow, that is super powerful. You, the, the film is absolutely incredible. Uh, what do you want people to take from it as they watch The Last Mountain? Oh, hope. I mean, well, a couple of things. First of all, to recognize a lot of people say, well, why do mountaineers climb mountains? And, and, and isn't, it, um, isn't it selfish because they're, they're going to kill themselves and they're going to hurt people by, by doing so? Um, I've never subscribed to that. Uh, I think that, you know, I've said it before, I think we need people like mountaineers to because they, they, they are pushing boundaries. They are, they epitomize the human the human condition. We're back to that expression, human condition is an important one. You know, uh, we we as human beings are always pushing on and and you know, we're inventing things, we're discovering things, we're landing men on the moon, we're going to Mars, we're doing whatever. That's what we do. And I think that's epitomized by people who do things like climbing mountains. They're going one step beyond. So to, to, to a certain extent, I want the film to help explain what motivates mountaineers. But beyond that, it's about what we've been discussing, about that it, whatever your religious beliefs are, um, it doesn't stop the death of somebody. You know, your, your love for somebody doesn't stop the death of that somebody. And so there's always hope. There's always optimism. And I know Kate for a long time felt a debilitating hurt and pain. And I think sometimes she felt she couldn't maybe survive it almost. She's lost her mother as a young child. She's lost her brother. Uh, and how does she go on? Well, she, she has that strength and she's fighting it through. Um, and I think that comes over towards the end of the film. I won't give too much away. Of course. But, <laughs> but at the end of the film, I think it does finish on a, on a rather unexpected high in, in, the, sen- in the sense that um, she, she's found a way through her grief to, to life, be, to, to her own, the way she's going to live her own life. Um, and of course, the people that we, we grieve for, they're, they're the very people that would want us to mm-hmm. carry on. Your mother doesn't want you to, 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 to be in co- constant uh, state of pain and misery she wants you to push on and and make something of your life which of, of, quite clearly you're doing same with my parents but i will always have a little moment of of remembering them you know sometimes unexpectedly Some, something will remind me of my father and i'll have a little cry mm-hmm. hey i'm not ashamed about that um because grief is beautiful i love that and you know the the power of human resiliency 
um, on a small scale, like, uh, you know, I, I was talking to a therapist um, of mine, and I remember uh, me saying a few years ago, um, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if I could go on if I lost my my mom, my grandmother, and my mom, because they, the, they were my two rocks. Yeah. And then I lost my mom in November, and then a few months later I lost my mom. And then now it's a year later, um, and my therapist said to me, do you remember saying that to me? And I said, yeah. And she was like, and you're not dead. You know, you're not uh, in a, you know, in the basement, like never coming out. You're trying to continue living. And um, and that really kind of struck me as well, that that's really true. I thought, you know, I would have bet money that if, if my, my mom and mom had passed, you know, at, at a younger age, um, that I don't know what, I, you know, I'd end up in a loony bin or something because they were my, yeah. my, you know, yeah. rocks. And, um, but I'm learning the power of human resiliency. And part of that is, as you said, you know, neither of them would want me in a, you know, basement, uh, never leaving the house, you, you know, um, uh, uh, Allison would not w- want her children to, uh, you know, be tied down, chained to grief forever. They would want them to go out and, and you know, live their lives. And, uh, and humans, you know, so often do, you know, whether it's Ukraine, you know, as you said, with yeah. the look at the world rallying around it and um, that will to survive. I mean, who would have thought that you know, over a month into this, Ukraine is still fighting back. And, and yeah. it's that, that, that resiliency that, uh, that I don't yeah. think humans get enough credit for often enough. No, I don't, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit. We think of ourselves as, um, as, as weak and we're debilitated by the loss of a loved one. But actually, as we've been discussing, if you allow it, to, if you allow it, grief can fortify you. So your, your, your mother, your, 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 your nan, you know, my parents, by, by leaving us, I wish they hadn't, but that's life, they have fortified us, and, 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 and you in one way, me in another. And I think that Kate eventually will find that she is fortified um, more than she can imagine by Tom's departure from this world and her mother. Uh, it takes time. It's a... It's a, it's a that t- climbing that inner mountain um, is, is is tough. It's a t- it's a tough climb, but um, you know I think I think we can summit and get to the top. And um, but but never stop grieving and enjoy and, and actually learn to enjoy grieving because that that's the sign of lasting love, isn't it? It really is. Chris, thank you. I could talk to you for hours. You are super fascinating. A a you know wealth of wisdom thank you so much for speaking with me thank you for giving us the last mountain a beautiful film and uh and thank you i really 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 enjoyed our conversation likewise it's been a great pleasure thank you so much thank you hope to talk to you again you bet how insane is that story it's absolutely insane i cried just absolutely nuts. So go see The Last Mountain. Links in the show notes. Go watch Billy the Kid. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. It's going to be one of those you know, water cooler shows like The Vikings that people are talking about and are excited about. Really incredible show. All right. That's all I got for you this week. Please let me know what you think. Hit me up. Email me if you're on the iHeartRadio app. You can use the talk back feature and uh, and talk right back to me. You get 30 seconds. It gets sent right to me. If you're not, go to my site, podcast.popcultureweekly.com, and there's a talk back feature there that you can hit me up and let me know what you think. Send me that love mail. Send me that hate mail. Whatever you're thinking about the show, whatever you're watching, listening to, you know, all that good stuff. All right? I will talk to you soon. I love you. We out. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Weekly. Hear all the latest at popcultureweekly.com.